Ok, eh, buenas tardes a todos. Bienvenidos y tengo el placer de presentar a Nicolás Reco del MIT, que nos va a dar una conferencia súper interesante. Eh, va, va, va a ser aproximadamente 30 minutos de conferencia y después cortamos el vídeo y empezamos las preguntas que queramos hacer. ¿De acuerdo? Sí. Uh, so the middle, if you can put it in, in a presentation mode. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to stand here. Hopefully, I'm not covering the slides. Hello, everyone. I am Nicola Greco, and I had the, uh, had the amazing opportunity to join MIT a couple of years ago, at the very beginning, for a master and then uh, for a PhD program. And at the same time, I was at the Beckman Center with Summer, and we had incredible opportunities to. Um, discuss two years before everything was going to happen what we thought it was going to happen and it was an incredible opportunity to have that type of conversations and I, I hope you all can have this type of conversation with Simon now discussing the next future of uh, what's going to happen in the next two years. I am right now taking a break out of MIT and I'm, I joined Protocol Labs which is a company that I've contributed Plenty before, and they do a couple of uh, um, they do a couple of uh, projects that you've, you you might have seen, and I'm happy to introduce th through all of it. And this presentation, I didn't know what type of audience we would have had, so it's going to cover uh, on a very abstract way what um, what got me interested in the space and what type of things I'm working on right now. And there are there's going to be some in depth, and then there's going to be some formal conversation on what. What, where is this space heading and why is this important even beyond com the uh, computer science? So protocol labs, uh, also little disclaimer, I'm absolutely not interested in speculation. I'm not interested to understand what is going to be the price of Bitcoin tomorrow or even the price of Filecoin, which is one of the things I'm working on. I am absolutely not interested in any of this. I'm here, like most of you, I hope, for the technology and it, because in the time, in, as soon as there will be... Um, some form of blockchain winter, everyone will disappear and the people that will be um, very interested in the space will still hang around and I want to be one of those. Um, so Product Labs does a, uh, does a set of, um, has a set of projects and the spirit of Product Labs is we want to upgrade the current web because there are some clear issues which we're gonna work through together. And we built something that's called IPFS you can, um, is a way to distribute files in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion, and um, then which relies on other protocols. One of these IPLD, which stands for, IPFS stands for Interplanetary File System, is a file system where you, have, you can share your hard disk with other people in the rest of your network. And then you have uh, IPLD, leap P2P, and if you are into uh, distributed systems and peer-to-peer -peer systems, then leap P2P is a library that allows you to build other type of things. Uh, so for example, IPFS is built on top of lib P2P and you could build BitTorrent and systems like that on top of lib P2P. There are current efforts, for example, to, you, to bring Ethereum, which is a cryptocurrency, on top of lib P2P and there are going to be other efforts because it, was, it would be best if there would be one network library instead of every single protocol doing independent network libraries. And then at the very end we have Filecoin. And you can think of IPFS in a way like BitTorrent allows you to uh, store and download data from computers of other people, but who is going to store my personal pictures if they are not relevant to the network? It's really easy to, to get a popular movie, but it's not easy to get my own personal data. And how can I incentive, how can I ask a network to store my data, well, I could pay the network in first place, and that's how we solve that problem in Filecoin. And there are going to be four parts. The first part is the decentralized web, and then this idea of universal services, which is what I'm really interested in. And how do you build something like Filecoin, and then why crypto networks could be interesting for um, the space in general, regardless of um, the, the technology behind it. So part one, decentralize, decentralizing the web. Um, one, of the, one of the key things that got me really interested into the space was um, thinking the way the current web works. And for example, what are, we, we use the web for 
some very fundamental um, operations like talking with our colleagues, talking with our family. Um, it, messaging is, is like a, uh, one of the key things that we do in our daily, uh, um, daily routine, in the same way as storing files in the cloud or using websites like um, Airbnb to book houses, to book rooms and so on. So the question is, every single interaction that you, go, you do through the web today goes through a service provider. And do we always require a service provider? So imagine, for example, if the service provider asks for a fee, do we need to pay this fee in order to get this service? Uh, if the service provider decides to shape the service in a way that you don't like, do you st for example, say for example, I want a dislike button on the Facebook. Can I have a dislike button on Facebook? No, I cannot. I need to rely on the, um, on the way the service provider designs the platform. What if the service pro provider becomes the enemy? In a, in a, li in a, in a time in which uh, our, all of our data uh, are in the hands of big platforms, what happens if we go in the, what happens if, because the world is now, uh, everything looks like it's in peace, but what if we are in, I don't want to bring things to the extreme, but when uh, Juan uh, from Product Labs brought up this example, I was really shocked. The Nazi Germany got the census data, which were uh, private and public data to find where the enemies of the public were. What if the equivalent uh, happens in the United States, finding for some special type of immigrants that don't fit? Anyway, there, are, there, is a, um, there is a lot to think about whether the service providers should be in power of control of your data, of the communication, and whether we should try to think of doing the same type of technologies, but instead, I could talk, if I am talking with Sam and both of us are online, can we send messages to each other by connecting to each other machines? Of course, having a service provider solves a lot of problems. Sam doesn't need to be online when, when I'm not online, and, but, but maybe in a peer-to-peer -peer system we could pass through, we can store data in networks of other people that, for example, in, like in Freenet or systems like that, you can, you can store your data in other machines that will eventually uh, broadcast the message. Or we could even incentivize a network to do some work for us. So for example, sending messages to Summer when Summer is now, um, uh, is, is then gonna come back online. So the key fundamental question is, do we need to rely on this central service provider? And, and I think the big question is, uh, it would be ideal if we don't, and if we don't, uh, if, if we don't rely, can we build such systems that can compete, which means they can be at least equivalent, or they could be even better. If we could build an infrastructure for the web, which is even better, but for example, it's more resilient, or it's more, uh, for example, um, in the IPFS way of thinking, which we're gonna go later on, if I have a file and some, uh, some of you in this first row have a file, it would, and have a file that I need, or someone back at the end of this room has a file that they need, I would rather get the file from the people that are close to me than the people that are far away from me. So there are some hints of what could be more efficient in practice um, by taking the decentralized web approach. Definitely one big thing that we gain, in my opinion, is verifiability. Meaning that I can, I, uh, verifiability and some more form of control, because if I am in control of my data, I can choose who I can give the data to, and if I give this data to someone else, I can verify that this someone else has operated correctly. Um, what does I said the word decentralization a lot of time, and what does decentralization mean? In the, in the literature, you can find a lot of different opinion on what decentralization mean. I'm really biased coming from the Beckman Center, and having heard Yokai Bankler talking and writing, um, one of his latest writings from winter 2016 talks about decentralization as this, this idea of deconcentration of power. So um, instead of having one service provider, we could have multiple, or, or any of you could become a service provider. On a technical um, 
perspective, a distributed system is a system where you have, in, when you have independent machines that communicate with each other through message passing, and they have different. They could they could have aligned clock, or the clocks might be um, not aligned with each. There could be a difference in between the, the clocks. But the idea is that there's one owner of for these machines. So, for example, Google. Or uh, whenever they want to store you, they, whenever they store your data, they store them in their huge server farms and they replicate the data across multiple uh, data sets. But all of these machines are centrally coordinated by Google, and there is a huge wall around these machines so that you cannot interact, you cannot hack these machines to behave in a way that is not according to the protocol. Decentralized systems is the same thing as distributed systems, same. Very similar setting. The only big difference is there is no single trusted node in the network. Every node in the network could be managed by different individuals. These individuals could be even competing or malicious. For example, if we have a malicious node in the Google server farm, given the type of algorithms that they run, they, it might be um, it, it could create really catastrophic um, outcomes. Well, instead, when we, dis when we design decentralized system, we design such that a malicious node can do damage until a certain extent. Um, let's walk very quickly through the history of peer-to-peer -peer systems. And, and I don't know if you want to consider the web as a peer-to-peer -peer system or not, but the web at the very beginning uh, had, there was this idea. I have my own server, I put my web page on my own server, and then I give this page to the rest of, to, to the, rest of the network, and if everyone has their own servers, then that's kind of decentralized. The, uh, the issue with that is that um, when these servers become really, really um, um, verticalized on, on offering one particular type of service, so for example, a social network, then we all rely on going on this server and we all look like clients. And we are all clients of the server. And we need to trust that the server provides the right service, that it's secure, that it's always online, and that there is no single, uh, that, it, that becomes our single point of reference. If someone else has, for example, the same data and we look for that data, we can only get that from the server for which we know the address of. We cannot just ask to, to the network of servers to give the data that we need. And in the peer-to-peer -peer setting is, this is a bit different. Uh, every node provi can provide the same service to other people. So for example, on BitTorrent, every BitTorrent is a client, but at the same time is also a server. And so it's literally a peer connecting to another peer, and they have the same type of capabilities. And the issue with this type of systems is that a network like BitTor BitTorrent or even IPFS is an altruistic network. People participate into the network because they are altruist. They may have incentives which are outside of the protocol, but if I put a file, it's because, for example, I'm earning some reputation, or just I want to store the file because that's how the platform, the client, software client makes uh, makes it work. And and then, um, but this is kind of problematic because in a, in a, in other systems, I have, for example, to store someone else's data on my computer. I, if I just want to be a client, I just want to be a client. I don't want to be another peer in the, ne in the network. So I think what the, the, the way the systems are developing, uh, especially after Bitcoin and after thinking about in adding incentives in peer-to-peer uh, -peer systems, then I can just be a client. I don't have to store someone else's data. I don't have to do anything for the network. But I can ask the network, which is not a single individual, it's a network of indiv individuals, to provide that service to me. So it's the equivalent of being a node in BitTorrent, not storing any file for anyone, but wanting the BitTorrent network to store, me, to store a file for me. And, and, and that's basically what systems like Filecoin want to achieve. Some nodes can, can actively, actively contribute to the network and earn value from the network. Some nodes will just um, use the network and pay the network for providing that service. And I think this is a new category of peer-to-peer -peer systems. And I want to talk, um, um, also I just realized that this slide uh, in, the in the translation showed this very last point. So I kind of give you, uh, I kind of uh, give you the answer of my future question, but I want to quickly talk about IPFS, and I don't know uh, how many of you have seen IPFS, but 
IPFS is uh, is a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing platform. There are over 5 billion files. It's used from legal documents, video distribution, streaming games, and there are plenty of use cases, and there is a lot of blockchain uh, applications being built on top of IPFS today. There are a lot of scientific, th there are a few um, research groups that are starting to look into IPFS and building on top of IP IPFS. So definitely something that uh, um, worth looking into if you're doing research in the space. And how does IPFS work? We have this idea of hashing, a, a, a cryptographic hash function. It's, it's, it's more or less a machine which we put some data in and spits out an array of bytes uh, and it's uh, of a specific size. And if, you, if, you, if I put a blog post and I put it in and it outputs uh, a hash, and if I put a blog post with a comma turned into a dot, meaning that a little change, then the hash is completely different. And for me, to have a particular hash that I want, it would be computationally too expensive. So basically, I cannot, um, I cannot um, find very easily collisions. This means that if I have the hash of a file, then I can give the file to Summer. Um, I know the hash of the file. I, I remove the file from my computer. And then I ask um, Summer, hey, Summer, give me the file. He gives me the file. But if I don't trust Summer, because we are in the decentralized settings system, then I can just take the hash of the file. If the hash of the file matches the hash that I have, then I have a guarantee that that's the file I wanted. And this, pro this property is called integrity, and it's, it's at the core of IPFS. And the, this also gives you some, uh, one very nice property, because in the way we ask for content on the web is, I want the nicolagreco.com slides. And I, there is only one single peer that has, say that there are all the people in yellow have the slides, there's only one single peer that is, can answer that query. But um, if we ask who has the data, so if we ask by the hash of the data, then, we, then whoever has the data then can become a contributor. And this, this content addressing is at the core of IPFS and a lot of other systems. Um, and the idea is that we want to have a content addressable web. So web pages link to each other through cryptographic hash functions to cryptographic hashes, and then naturally you can verify every page that you receive, but also the page, the links, the pages, the links, the pages, the links, the pages, and so on. We can look that, about that in, later on. And there are a lot of systems like Ethereum, Bitcoin, Git, um, IPFS, they use this idea. And okay, this is one component, then there is another component, which is decentralized hash tables that have been out for since 2000. And, um, I'm going to have a little pause in a second so we can ask questions on the first part. But at the, I, I don't want to go in depth in, in the concept of DHT, but on the abstract level, it looks something, it looks something like this. Um, there is a, all the peers in the network, and the peer in the network does the hash of the public key, and they put themselves in a ring. And then whenever I want to add a file, I take the hash of the file. The hash of the file starts with G. I look at the peer that handles all the list of files that starts with G. So in this case is F. So F now writes on his own node that my, my IP has that file. So every single time you want to find a file in the, into the network, then you, will have, you, need, you need to ask just to any node. And any node, by give, looking at the hash, will point you to F. And F will point you to the IP of the machine that has that file. I understand that this was very quickly and rushed through, but there are a lot of systems that use DHTs. And this is, uh, what we want to get out of this is that there are ways for which we can have a network that coordinates to, um, that coordinates to uh, hold some form of arc list of who has what file. And IPFS is built on top of this. Oh, OK. I don't know what happened there. Mm, I think the clicker may have abandoned me. No. We're, OK, so this is the end of part one. We went through the decentralized web. We went through some ideas of what IPFS is. Does someone have, I accept one question of misunderstand, if someone has misunderstood something, or if I missed something that you really wanted to ask? Otherwise, we can move. We have a lot of content going on. Quick. I have a question. Yeah. Um, in the case of BHT, uh, if that node uh, fails, yeah. uh, where does that information, uh, is this information lost, or it is replicated in another node? Nodes, 
will keep on announcing the files that they have. So if then node disappears, then there are, uh, then the, and the new node will take that information. But generally, it's not one node; it's a set of nodes. Yeah, and 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 uh, yes. The, uh, that's actually a really open uh, research topic, and how do you do message passing in a? How do you com how do you just send messages to the network without the network knowing who you are, and receive a message back? Is an, there is a lot of work being done in that uh, in, in in that work. Some people would say you can use Tor, but I don't think that's the right answer long term. In terms of what hash you're looking for, in terms of your data, you, if, if it is your data and you're scared of the network storing your data, then that's a different, that's a different question. Uh, because um, you can encrypt the data and give the data to the network. And then, yes, the network will know that you're looking for that hash. And maybe they could profile you. This, this is an uh, open field. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not giving you any finalized, this is how things work. This is a, what's happening in this space. So I will go a little bit more quickly. And also, um, the last part is um, more abstract. So if we don't have time to go through the last part, we can go through that in the questions. And um, universal services, this is a concept that was born in, in um, at and And this is the idea of a universal service. It's a service that everybody needs, and someone should provide for everyone. And the way at and decided to do this was with this um, uh, sentence, which was one policy, one system, universal service, which stands for we are at and we have one policy with the government of the United States to be the regulated monopoly offering a telephone to all the United States, one system. So we have one system only. We don't have other phone companies. Otherwise, we lack of interoperability. And universal service because we want to make sure that everyone has connection to the phone, to the landline. And the problem is that universal, universal services have been done uh, in a pretty much centralized way by big regulated monopolies. Think of the postal service and think of the internet service providers. And the question is, can we use the ideas that we learn from the decentralized web or or in general, is the question just about decentralizing the web or decentralizing any type of service? And I think that's what really motivates me, which is trying to build universal services like the cloud, not being just one company offering the cloud to the rest of the world, but having everyone participating in offering, um, in offering cloud services to the rest of the world. And there is one key problem, though, which is uh, say that we have uh, Summer wants to buy Summer this. Like, this is nothing compared to what's going to come next. Uh, <laughs> so there is Nicola and Sama, and Nicola wants, Nicola wants to tell the picture, his own pictures to Sama. And then this is the fair exchange problem. And we want to make sure that Sama, that the exchange is fair, Sama gets the picture, I get the money, or, no, no, or nothing happens. And Sama, I cannot give the money to Sama, and I have to wait forever, and Sama never gives me the, the, the um, he cannot lock my money forever. So, Things either happen or don't happen. And then now we have evil Nicola that receives the money from Sava and never gives the picture and run, and run away with the money. Oh, Italians. Let's see what the Spanish do. <laughs> so we have Nicola sending the picture to Sama and Sama run away without paying. So can we solve this? And in practice, how do you think we could solve it? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So this is actually an impossible problem. You cannot solve it without a trusted third party. And it's an impossibility result which says there is no fair exchange without third party and without other assumptions. Now, with some other assumptions, I think you can... Um, so, for example, I say that, for example, I don't trust Sama, but uh, he trusts me. And this is how we use web services online today. I mean, we trust that they're going to give us the storage. Uh, but they don't trust us to pay. So what we do, we generally pay, and, and then we offer the service. And oh, for example, we could build up trust slowly. These are reputation systems. I give you a little piece of my picture, and it gives me a little, uh, sorry. I give a, uh, he gives me a little payment, and give a little bit of my picture, and we go on, on and on and on. This is actually how Filecoin works. And then um, otherwise, we can just rely. We don't trust each other. We're just going to rely on a third party. 
But the third party, should the third party be a single person? No. The third party could be two people agreeing with each other, three people, four people, n people. So far, the trusted party has been a permission system with n parties, but now with permissionless systems, which we don't know how permissionless in practice they are, because it has, people converge in mining pool, and at the very end, you still trust five groups of people. But um, I wish we could uh, make a permissionless systems more egalitarian, and I think this is another open problem. And, um, and, and then we could replace the third party with a, with a, with a blockchain, for example, or with a, with a set of parties, agreeing that the exchanges happen. And so we have, these slides summarize what I'm saying, is that we can have a trusted party, we can, have, we can use trusted hardware or trusted machinery, so the machine, whatever we do, they're still gonna do whatever they were, they were meant to do. And then we can have trusted auditors, we have a group of people that says, yes, the, this has happened, and we're gonna look into that in a second, and, and other type of parties. And what we rely on, uh, on, on Bitcoin, for example, is the majority of mining power. If the majority of mining power agrees, then uh, we can write a little contract that there is the third party being the blockchain agreeing on the, on the transaction. And what is a blockchain? I don't know how many have seen the concept of blockchain before. Oh, this is so good. We're going to go through this very quickly. Um, there is a, something in the cloud, and, uh, and, and, and everyone talks to this something in the cloud, which is operated by a network of people. We're going to see how it's operated in a second. And I can, and every single thing, everyone can write, everyone can read, and all the rights are, in, are, are perfectly audited. So I can write, add two euros to the, to the ledger, and add this patent to the ledger, so someone in the future can say, I want to patent this, but actually the patent was uh, shown, the, the same material was shown before in the past at that particular point in time, and we agree that the ledger is trusted, and the ledger is like the trusted third party that puts all the requests in order, regardless of what the request is. And the idea behind is that Every node, in the network, every node in the network has this log of operation, and then they pass this log of operation through an, uh, through an application. In the case of a, of a, of a cryptocurrency, the, the application is uh, account, ba account and balance checking. So for example, I can send one, I can send one euro, two euro, three euro, and then the, every single time I, 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 write, I, I do these operations, I write them on the ledger, and while I write them on the ledger, it's the equivalent of writing them in a log that then we process this log with the account balancing. So at the very end, the, the, block, the blockchain will agree that you have $6 at this particular point in time. But the idea is that you can make digital currencies in a permission setting. It would look more or less like this. I'm abstracting away a lot of things. But I send five euros for someone, and I, may, and I tell everyone they send these five euros to Summer, and then uh, everyone talk to each other and then they confirm. They all agree they have said that. And after they agree, then everyone writes on their own balance, which is the equivalent of the thing that was in the sky, which in practice wasn't in the sky, but was in the computers of all the participants, and so on, and so on, and so on. And, and th this is a permission setting, so we have a limited amount of parties. In Bitcoin, um, make sure that things are written probabilistically once every 10 minutes, and there is some form of election for the nodes that um, the writes the block, and the election is based on how much you vote. You vote on your machine power. The more machine power, the more CPU power you have, the more vote you have to to say. The more power you have to say, the more power you have for saying what's going to be written in in the ledger. And and then and, and then going back to the fair exchange problem, say that we want to um, we want to write uh, we want to have a domain name system. Um, uh, so, for example, if I name a file on my computer, Nicola, uh, and, it's, and, and, it's, and, I, and I send it to Summer, Summer might have already a file that is called Nicola. So, the global naming is a problem that has been looked into for years, and that's how, um, and, and, and that's how it works uh, on the web today. We have the DNS, which is the trusted party. We go to the DNS, to the name provider, and we say, I want to buy this name. The, the name provider writes on its own ledger what, they, one, what names have been bought, and if someone else goes there, then, uh, then they cannot. And there are 
advancements like the certifi certificate transparency, which is not just a trusted party. It's a trusted party that this trusted party is not really a trusted party. Me, as a name provider, I need to generate a log, and all of you must be able to verify my log at any time. If you see that I've misbehaved, then you can report my misbehave and I, to, to the legal system, and I can be heavily penalized for having done so. So there are ways to mitigate the power of the trusted party. Another way of naming things in a global way could be, for example, taking the hash of a file. So if I take the hash of a file, like we do on IPFS, then we all agree that that would be the hash of a file because we have this cryptographic assumption. Um, we talked about that earlier. We can, if you have more questions, uh, we can go later. But the cryptographic hash generates names which are not human readable. Can we have human readable name? This was uh, the Zucos triangle. Can we have human readable names which are also secure and decentralized? And if we have the third party being the blockchain, for example, um, there are already existing systems like Blockstack or ENS, I can write on the blockchain one name I want. Everyone agrees that I, call, I wanted that name. And whoever is going to claim that name later on cannot, because we have this, trust, this trusted party which handles the ledger in this way. So this is the type of applications that, uh, that, 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 that we can do and in using the blockchain. I buy. Um, I pay something and, and I receive that something in a fair way because there is a trusted party that makes sure that that happens. And there are different types of assumptions. One is a trust assumption, one is a cryptographic assumption. In the blockchain, we have the assumption of majority, and you can think uh, in this way for multiple other problems. But the question that I posed during my master thesis <coughs> and what led eventually through to, to do something like Filecoin is, can we build fair exchange, which is not necessarily of objects or private inputs, but of actual of services. Meaning that I, provi I provide a service. So for, uh, the idea is, is the equivalent. But instead of me giving something to Summer, I offer a service to Summer. And as long as I offer, if I correctly offer the service, then Summer will pay me. If I, there is no such way such that I can convince Summer that I've done the job without doing the job, and still get paid. So um, the idea here is the following. is For every action that I do, I generate, for example, storing a file. He asked me to store a file. I generate a proof of having stored the file through time, which is, a, for example, a cryptographic proof, which everyone can validate. So even the trusted party can validate. Even the blockchain can validate. And what I could do, I could go, we could, both of us could go to the trusted party and say, Sam is going to give the money. Nicola is, gonna, is going to, if Nicola is going to generate proofs that he has been storing files, then perform the exchange. Now, the trusted party doesn't have to store any file. He literally has just to check that the file has, that, that the proof that I have generated was correct. There is no way such that I can generate an incorrect proof, or at least I can with incredibly small probability. So there's no way that I can fool the trusted party to perform the exchange if I haven't paid. So fair exchange of services is fair exchange, but instead of objects, of services. And every service that I, as long as there is, as long as there is a proof that I offer that service, and that proof can convince anyone, so even a blockchain, then we can write this smart contract that says, if I've done, um, if I've stored the file, then Sam is going to give me the money. So this is the idea. I go to the blockchain. I say, uh, I'm, oops, I'm going to deposit the money. And Nicola has to, has to generate proofs for one, one, one proof per day that he has stored a file. We're going to look into that what it means in a second. But I generate a proof for one each day uh, for four days in this case. And then the blockchain validates the proof. And then because I said, I will pay if it generates the proof, then the storage provider, the, the person in the middle, gets uh, rewarded. Did you lose anyone? If you lost, this is the best time. Because now we're going to have. Uh, so the, the idea is that we can have exchange of services of any kind. Right now, as long as you have a proof that you have offered a service, then. Um, then you can use the same primitive for, 
for building different fair exchange services. Say, for example, they have, they, have, they have a proof system that can prove to anyone that I have given electricity uh, to summer, energy, uh, energy to summer. Then we could build a, um, then, then we can have an exchange such that so I get, I can pay, without trusting summer, I can give electricity to summer and have a guarantee that eventually I will get paid because the blockchain or the trusted third party will give me a payment. And the, the bigger things that we can build if on top of this primitive is entire markets. And, that's, and this is the, the leap that I want to, you to bring into, which is if each of us, say for example for storage, if each of us could put, or, could put orders of buying rent, buy, of, to buy some storage, to offer some storage, or to buy some storage, uh, rent or offer some storage, then I don't need to trust Dropbox for offering me the service and be because Dropbox will be like everybody else will, will have to generate proofs that he stored my data but because Dropbox needs to generate proof him generating proof is the equivalent of Simon's laptop generating proofs as long as you have offered the service I will pay you so the, now in this exact moment you can create markets where you don't have to trust um, you don't need to trust any player in the market because you will only pay if they can prove they, if they can prove they have uh, offered you the service. So now Dropbox could be part of this market, but every one of you could be part of the market as long as you can generate valid proofs. So in in this case, this verifiability gives us this form of decentralization because now I don't have to go through one party and have this party generating proofs. But I can go even to parties that I don't trust at all. I, they could be uh, the, the least reassuring website for selling storage. As long as they are generating a proof they, and they, they offer the service, if they can, then they have offered the service to me, then they can get paid. So anyone can participate in this type of markets. Oops. Did I lose anyone? Because now we're going to build Filecoin on top of that. Is the verifiable market idea clear? There are two parties. As long as this can submit orders, and if the orders match, they have to, uh, they're going to serve. One is going to give the service, and the other one is going to provide. Um, this, yeah. I guess, I guess that uh, uh, this idea is what two parties, one provides service, the other one pays. Yeah. Oh yeah, of course, of course, of course, of course. This is the this is the base use case. You can you can exchange. You can probably so for example, I, I have to store some of your files, but you have to store some of my files to recreate this type of networks. How do you ensure that these people are storing each other's files? Then they can generate proofs to each other. I need to think a bit more about that, but that sounds. Of course, you can do it. Yeah, this is the last question. Yeah, so, so if I understood you well, so before having a transaction. Yeah. Yeah. You need to have a proof of work, right? Oh, okay. So, but what, okay, that, but what is a proof of work? It's a, it's a hash? It's a For, forget, forget. For, uh, I, I don't know what you mean by proof of work, but we're going to go into what I mean by you have to prove that you're, you've stored the file in a second. But there is a blockchain. This is a trusted third party. It's literally like one old lady writing down on a list, uh, this is what I've done, this is what I've done, this is what I've done. And... Um, and, and basically, we go to this trusted person, and, and she says, um, you, I'm going to give the money to Summer because Nic Nicola showed me that he had a proof that he has been storing that file. Now, it could be a trusted lady. It could be uh, at 100, the, the whole world coordinating with each other through a blockchain protocol. But I'm going to move into that in a second. Um, so let's build Filecoin. And what we want to build with Filecoin is a market for storage, where everyone can buy and sell storage from other people in the network. What we want to match is Dropbox. Now, Dropbox gives me the ability to do store files and get files. And we don't pay for each request that we do, but it's kind of the equivalent because we could pay monthly for the request that we do. And, but we don't want one single provider because of the rant that we had before. We want a network of users 
where anyone, as long as they have storage and as long as they have computing power to generate the proofs, then can, particip can participate. How do we store files without trusting the people? So the FileCon protocol is built on top of this proof of storage. And a proof of storage is the equivalent of I give my files to Summer. Uh, and then every single, if I want to be sure that Summer has my file, I can send him a challenge. And this challenge will trigger him to do some computation that when I see the computation, then I can say, yes, Summer ha had the file, or no, Summer didn't have the file. So we have a setup, I give the file to him, I have a challenge, he does the proof, and I verify. And the proof is, must be complete, sound, publicly verifiable, transparent, and useful. And what I mean by that is that if Summer is an honest player, Summer will always generate a good proof. If Summer is a dishonest player, it's, it can never generate a fake proof, or with very small probability. And then everyone should be able to verify that proof, not just me and Summer. And, and then there are other properties that we look, can look into that in a second. But I want to give you a very rough proof of retrievability, uh, or proof of storage. So, uh, this is a Merkle tree. We've gone through the concept of hashing before. A Merkle tree, we have, we have a file. We split the file in multiple pieces. We take the hash of each file, and we take the hashes of the hashes, the hashes of the hashes, and so on. And basically, now, the challenge, if, um, the challenge could be Summer has the data, and I only add the root hash, the hash over here. And I ask Summer, hey, Summer, I want you to give me the data at index number four. Now, Summer is going to give me this data, and it's going to give me the hash of this piece of data and the hash of these two pieces of data. And that's the proof that will allow me to check if he had the fourth piece of data. Because what am I going to do? I'm going to take the fourth piece of data. I'm going to take his hash. And then I'm going to take the hash of these two. I'm going to take the hashes of these two. I'm going to check if I, g I managed to generate the hash of the data that I originally had. It. I originally had. If I did, then Summer managed to give me a proof that he had the fourth piece. And if I keep on asking Summer different pieces, then all the time, then Summer sometimes give me two, sometimes give me three, sometimes one, and so on. And if I keep on asking Summer, the only way Summer can reply correctly to every single of my query is if he has the data. He cannot generate, give me some random data that I never stored, and these two blocks such that I can generate a root hash like the root hash that I had initially. So this is a very simple, simple proof of storage. But this proof of storage has three types of attack, and let's look into them right now. <laughs> so um, I'm going to give a file to Summer, and then but Summer uh, has also plenty of Sybils. So, and little parentheses. There are existing systems. Uh, in, uh, the, in, uh, they already have the software working, very similar to Filecoin, very similar ideas, but they use simple proof of storage very similar to the ones that we described before. But the, prob the problem is that just that is not enough. And I'm going to explain why. And this is somehow explaining what are the faults of existing systems. And uh, I give the file to Summer. And then Summer wants to be paid $5 for that file. Then Summer ha creates a new identity and says, I want to pay $5 to store the file. And then he creates a new identity, as many identities as he wants. And he convinced me that he's different people all the time. And basically, he gets to store one file instead of three files, and I, get, I pay him three times instead of once. So I'm convinced that I'm talking to other people, so I give different challenges to different, these different summers, and summer then generate for each of them a proof that they add the data. The thing is that summer only stored the data once, and which, basically, which basically means on other systems, if we don't uh, design proofs accurately, then what's going to happen is that, <coughs> is that people can trick the system and get paid for the storage that they don't have. So our proof, of, our proof of storage cannot be like the previous proof, because the proof that I showed before. Because then everyone is going to store the same file, and everyone is going to, uh, all the Sybils of Summer are just fake Sybils that just want to get paid. Now, there is another problem of proof of retrievability. The previous is called Sybil attack. This is called outsourcing attack. And I give, this, I, give this, I give the file to a trusted person like Nicola, and I give the file to another different trusted person like Nicola, and then I give the, sum, the file to Summer. Summer is evil in this case again, and he doesn't want to store the file. Because, you know, he can always get the file back from the other two Nicolas. Even, at, 
even if, so for example, I pay in summer $5, and summer for getting the whole file from Nicola might spend $1, for example. And then what happens is that this, when, I ask, when I give the challenge to Nicola, Nicola is going to send me two different proofs. When I, give the, when I ask the challenge to Simon, Simon says, hold on a second, let me go grab the file and let me come back and give you the proof. This is a, ter this is a terrible outcome because now Simon never stores any file. He just commits to store someone's files, but in practice, he never stores any file. And, and this is a, a problem that we need to overcome. And how do we overcome the first problem? Well. Instead of asking Summer to store one file, we ask Summer to store one file, and he has to generate his own unique copy. So if we ask every different player to, to have their own unique copy, then Summer 1, Summer 2, and Summer 3 cannot, have the, cannot reuse the same data, and they need to store three copies. So for, if Summer wants to do this attack, and he has one megabyte of storage, he cannot pretend to store three files, which are the same file, because it would have to store, it, it would need to have three megabytes in that particular point. So I send the challenge, and the first summer manages to give me the answer. The, the second and the third, just by storing one single copy, cannot answer to me. And this by just add, asking summer to, uh, asking every player in, in this protocol to generate its own copy of the files. And then we can make making the copy of the file really, really slow. And so, for example, now, Summer, remember the outsourcing attack, he would come to me and say, hey, give me the data. But then I spent six hours, for example, generating my own replica. Uh, Nicola spent six hours generating its own replica. Summer, even if he gets the data, he cannot generate the proof because he has to generate, he, he, he gets the file, he cannot generate his own replica on time to reply. Because I, I, I check, if Summer takes longer, Nicola can reply to the challenge, because after six hours of doing this, Nicola can reply to the challenge in one minute. Summer must wait six hours to generate from the data its own replica, and then sending the file back, um, it's going to take six, six hours plus one minute. So I can spot that Summer did this type of attack. Now, solving this type of attack makes the proof of, proof of replication. And the way we, discuss, the way our proof of replication is written in the Filecoin white paper is there are a lot of details. We're going to post an update, and then um, we're going to post an update really soon. And, uh, but it is still an open question. How can we make proof of replication um, really more efficient than the one that we have today? Uh, or how can we have uh, proof of replication with stronger, assum stronger cryptographic assumptions or without uh, the SNARK proving system that we have today? The idea is that, concluding on Filecoin, is that everyone can put, can put orders of selling storage and everyone can put um, uh, order of uh, buying storage. And, and we have two markets. We have, an, we have a market for storage and a market for retrieval. The market for storage, I pay nodes to store my files. And the market for retrieval, I pay anyone, whoever, even the people that are not storing my file, I, pay, I, pay the, I ask people in the network to give, the file, to give me the files that I need. In this way, some people will commit to store the data, and some other people will just temporarily have some data, and they, will, they, will, they, will, they, they never commit to store the data because they're only going to store the data that other people want to, make, to optimize the, their revenues. And, 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 and the idea for, for storage is that we, we've seen it before. I give the, I give the, whenever we, I find a matching order, we say that Summer is my matching order, I say to the blockchain, give this money if Summer generates a proof. And the blockchain now verifies if Summer has the proof. And I don't have to be present in this uh, conversation. And then, um, yeah, which is the equivalent of this. I don't know why I have the same slide. And then, um, then I have the retrieval market. In the retrieval market, um, it would be too expensive to ask the blockchain to be the trusted third party to witness every single, uh, to witness the transfer of the file. Um, and, 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 and so we need to rely on other assumptions, which is the assumption that, that, we, that we described before. I go to Sam and I give a little piece of my file. Uh, Sam gives me a little bit of money and give you a little piece of my file and so on until I give him the full file. But we rely on, on, on one big assumption, which is there is, at, given your data, there is at least, 
you, you, there is at least one honest participant that is willing to give you files. Because if, you only, if only Summer has the files and he misbehaves, then he could say, I give you every single piece except the last one. And the last one, I, I, don't, want, I don't want you to pay 50 cents. I want you to pay $50. Because the last piece is going to make sure that you have the entire file. But if you have a network of users that have your files, then if someone wants fifty dollars, you can go. In the, you can ask to the rest of the network to give you the rest, to give you some other files. Uh, we can talk about this in the questions, but I think it's um, it's more important to outline that there are some open questions. That even in Filecoin, uh, even in Filecoin, we haven't looked into. And how can we have efficient proof of replication? How can we overcome front-running attack, which we didn't really describe? And, um, and <coughs> on part four, I will take two extra minutes. I'm sorry, Summer. Uh, but th there, is a, there is something big going on in the space. I, I want to, I want, I want to uh, make you think about this way. Uh, OK, I just going this slide, there were literally two more slides. I think uh, there are a lot of. I if by clicking, I will take five minutes. By just telling you, I will take will take a few seconds. The way we build universal services so far has been by having big regulated monopolies with a huge amount of money. Systems like Bell Labs uh, managed to in 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 managed, ma could afford having a 15 years MVP before they made a transistor. And then we moved from um, from this type of uh, regulated mark regulated monopolies to um, things like open source. Everyone can contribute to build this service for everyone. And then we reach something like the sharing, sharing economy. Who, each one of us can share some part of our, uh, of, of, of our house or what we own. And the idea is, can we do the same in a decentralized fashion and where everyone in the network can be some form of entrepreneur themselves so, for example, me as a, as a miner in, this, in the Filecoin network, I could invest and buy more storage because the more storage I provide to the network, the more I earn, and the more I earn, the more I could keep on buying storage. So, we have, a, we have new type of systems where you, the same users in the network could, um, could create value in the network so everyone, um, everyone earns by um, providing value to the network. This point was rushed. Um, but I think what this is really important. We have, we're witnessing a new type of organization, which are organizations which are not controlled by single parties, and, and everyone can contribute in making this organization uh, work and improve and create value. And the, big, the biggest questions that are yet to come are the ones that I think Summer is looking into, which is how do we govern this new type of organizations, and what type of communities can we build around them? Thank you very much. <laughs>